Good evening, everyone. Um, welcome to this um, short introductory webinar for NHS dental practices um, that are or will be providing urgent dental care in Yorkshire and Humber. Uh, my name is Imran Sweda. I'm a current leadership fellow with Health Education England and a registrar in oral surgery. Um, the information within this webinar will be useful for all dental practices within the region. Um, we'll be recording this webinar so that if anyone misses it or part of it, there will be a chance to catch up. I would like to thank ProDental CPD for hosting the webinar on our behalf and also the colleagues that have contributed to this education package. I will now hand over to the postgraduate dental dean, James Spencer. Um, good evening, everybody, um, and thank you for attending the webinar. Uh, NHS England, um, Public Health England and the deanery have been working incredibly hard to develop this training package. Um, we are very aware of the urgent need for education in relation to the provision of dental care uh, for our patients, and this webinar is a first step to ensuring all of you in primary care can start accessing this training and, and developing our skills in this area. Uh, the webinar is uh, being held in conjunction with three documents that hopefully you've all uh, got and have been distributed, uh, along with a link that came uh, for the, the webinar tonight. And we hope to provide you with uh, lots of information. Uh, lots of answers and some clarification of some of the more difficult aspects of what we're trying to achieve. Uh, I'm sure it'll stimulate even f more further questions and what we'd like is that you continue to send those in so we can actually uh, help you with that. In terms of the ongoing education in relation to urgent dental care during this COVID-19 outbreak, uh, we're working really hard to provide what you guys need out there. Uh, we'll be elaborating on this um, within our next steps and requesting that practices and teams help by informing us of their current and potential future needs uh, in terms of training. Uh, can I just echo what Imran has said and thank Pro Dental for facilitating tonight's webinar uh, to support all the dental teams across Yorkshire and the Humber. Imran, back to you. Thank you. Um, tonight's webinar will aim to provide a brief overview of the urgent dental care system in Yorkshire and Humber. We are aware that there's been somewhat of an information vacuum regarding urgent dental care centres and so we aim um, to highlight key areas including an overview of the current urgent care system within Yorkshire and Humber, including the UDC arrangements. We'll be highlighting key aspects of UDC practice setup and patient flow and we'll be discussing the infection control measures needed to be implemented to reduce the risk of transmission. Once we've covered these areas, at the end of the webinar, we'll be able to take a limited number of questions. We've already received a number of questions via email. Uh, where we are unable to answer these questions today, we will collate a, a list of frequently, uh, fre frequently answered questions and upload these uh, for access for everyone. Um, I will now um, hand back over to uh, Simon Hernshaw, um, Chair of the LDN North Yorkshire. Okay, I'll start again. Many, many thanks for joining. I think we all recognise that to a greater or lesser extent, we are currently all working outside our respective comfort zones. That's certainly the case for our commissioning teams, local dental networks, LDCs, practices, GDPs, and I think the entire dental team. These are exceptionally unprecedented times with huge challenges for populations, healthcare, and in particular dentistry. What we need is guidance and structure so we can all work collectively to safely deliver dentistry's response, our response, to the pandemic in Yorkshire and Humber. One second. So I've already been struck by the support from LDNs across England and especially the support locally in Yorkshire and Humber across local dental committees, PHE, the Community Dental Service and Secondary Care. So thank you very much. So this evening I'm going to summarise some points and refer you to the documents we have sent out and the ed education we're putting together with Pro Dental. The guidance has been developed nationally within COVID-19 standard operating system and adapted enhanced locally within the local model. The national SOP is the overarching guidance that we're all going to work to. All the princ principles are around providing face-to-face -face urgent care only when it's absolutely necessary 
And so we aligned with, so we're completely aligned with the principles of the delay phase, lockdown, social distancing, regard, regard for patients at, greatest, at the greatest risk, so we can deliver urgent dental care safely for, for patients and for our dental teams. Okay, so the national guidance is then applicable to the delay phase and the delivery of urgent dental care in line with the wider response. So let's have a look at the principles and then work through how we've developed these in the systems we are developing in Yorkshire and Humber. So the principles are broadly that we need to, we need to align what we do with COVID-19 delay phase. We need, we need to ensure that travel is only essential. We need to reduce the transmission risk. We need to ensure that we separate vulnerable and shielded groups. We've got to do a COVID assessment or we've got to use strict decontamination protocols. And we only really should refer for face-to-face -face care if it's absolutely necessary. And treatment, treatment cannot be delayed, and we, and we should only refer to UDC sites for face-to-face -face consult consultation in these circumstances. We need to be very aware that we need to signpost those patients who are shielded and at increased risk through, through specific pathways. So we should only undertake face-to-face -face care after second triage, and that's a remote triage. And we should only provide face-to-face -face, face -face care if we've got appropriate personal protective equipment. So, so the SOP then goes on to describe patient groups. So we'll labour this because it's all in the SOP, but group one is, is the, is those, are those patients with COVID-19 or those suspicious, or they were suspicious of having COVID-19, so those patients with symptoms and who have persistent coughs or are living with, with someone with um, the illness in their household. Group two are those patients that are shielded. Those, group three are those patients that are at increased risk, so the vulnerable groups. And group four are those, fit, are those, are those patients that don't fit in, in any of those categories, so they're fit and healthy patients. And we need to make significant efforts to make sure that we separate the fit and healthy patients from those who are vulnerable and shielded. So what are the key principles identified in the SOC that underpin our local UDC systems? So our UD systems will need to flex and adapt as they develop. We've got to try and use and, and adapt existing UDC arrangements, and that's what we're doing with the dental partner and night dental services. We need to manage referrals effectively between primary and secondary care. And we've got to do that in a much more efficient, faster way under the circumstances. We've got to collaborate between services. We need to design local approaches, and that's what we're doing at the present. And we've got to take into account that the patient journey is two-stage, remote triage and then face-to-face -face stage if absolutely necessary. So let's look now at the, the work we've been doing in, in Yorkshire and Humber with our local model. But you've all read that. So basically the triage and remote consultation in the clusters remains more or less the same. So all dental practices and the CDS are responsible for triaging patients who contact their practices seeking urgent care. And this is regardless of whether they are considered regular patients or not. So that includes private patients. So private patients can access urgent care through the cluster and UDC system. It's quite a complicated map there of um, flow diagram. You can have a look at that, that's in the SOP, but I'll try and simplify that for you now. So we're establishing groups of practices and we're calling those clusters. So there are three here, Helmsley, Kirby, Moorside and Pickering, Ripon and Scarborough. So within each cluster, we've identified a cluster UDC site, urgent dental care site. So those are highlighted in, in grey. So each cluster is a number of practices between six and 12. And at the center of that, we've got one single, or in some cases, two UDC sites. So that basically, um, the, U the clusters work with the UDC site to deliver the urgent care within that geographical area. And you can see there are, there, are, there, are, there are highlighted boxes on the right-hand side, blue and orange. 
So all three of those UDCs will support care for groups two, three, and four. And there's a, an additional green highlight, and that signifies that the practice in Ripon is what, we, what we're describing as a super hub. What we're trying to do is strategically turn these um, clusters on um, in a systematic way that makes sense in terms of the geography. So we're mass fitting those practices first and then rolling the program out. So it's just a map really showing all the cluster practices and you can see where the, um, the stars are, they're where the actual UDC sites are within those clusters. So we've tried to place those in sensible places so we can make it easy, easier for patients to access those dental care without traveling large distances once we've got those sites working. We've also sent out some agreements to UDCs and you'll, you'll have received those now, I hope. So basically it's about you, if you've been identified as a cluster UDC, you need to sign that and get it back to us as soon as possible. And we're going out to all the cluster group, uh, all the cluster practices and asking them to complete a, a data form so we can get some idea of the staffing and then send those, those forms to the UDC. So hopefully in a few days time, we'll have collected all those returns and they will be with the uh, cluster UDC sites so that they can begin to shape their workforce. What we think is when, when practices begin to run this, they'll, the, the UDC site will probably use their own staff to start with. So they get the system working properly and then introduce staff from other practices. Some practices, large practices, may decide to run it entirely with their own staff. You know, we have flexibility with that within our systems for that to happen. So we've got a two-stage triage. Stage one is at the cluster site and stage two is at the cluster UDC site. So and we've got a two-component triage. So component one is the urgent care need and component two is it the COVID, is to find out what they assess the COVID status. So this is happening at, the, in, at this stage within the cluster practice. So what the cluster sites need to understand, what do they need to know? They need to know, they need to triage, they need to provide AAA, and they need to know how to refer onto the hub. And they've got to, got to understand how they fulfill the compliance for the data set. So I'll run through that now. I'm not going to go into any detail on emergency dental care. Just suffice to say that if you encounter a, a patient who requires emergency care, you refer it into that emergency service. If you require, if you come across a patient who requires just advice, you just give them advice. And we're really interested in the box in the centre, the yellow box. So we've got to establish whether the patient needs urgent care. And if it does, to start with, what we'll be doing is giving them AAA, or in some cases, immediately referring them into um, the UDC, the cluster UDC. Clearly, if you need emergency care, you, you accelerate that referral into the emergency service, which is basically A&E and the local MaxFax department. So the SOP gives us some pretty clear definitions of what, what urgent care is, and, we, and we're going to apply those. So once we've established that the patient requires urgent care, and that that patient requires urgent care and severe enough to warrant a face-to-face -face, um, encounter with the cluster UDC, we need, to establish, we need to establish what their COVID status is. Remember, we're triaging this hard. It's only if it's absolutely necessary. That's a fundamental point in all of this. So we need to establish the COVID status, so we need to ask them questions to identify whether they're COVID positive or COVID, or COVID suspicious. Once we've established that and they've got an urgent care need that requires face-to-face -face care, we refer them to a COVID site. Well, now we've got three of those. York, I believe, has just come on live. And we've got one in York, Sheffield and Leeds. These, these centres aren't particularly busy. We don't think they're busy, but we have to triage appropriately, obviously. And we may eventually turn some of that capacity to deliver other kinds of care but we'll have to see how this pans out. If they're shielded following the assessment, we need to, we need to triage them and send them to the appropriate UDC centre 
or the appropriate service provided by the CDS. And that will be different in each locality. But we're going to develop a, a directory of services that will be kind of area-based that will tell you what's available in each of your areas. So clusters are aware where they refer to. They'll always refer to the hub, and the hub, the UDC centre, will decide where to send that patient for urgent care. If it's a vulnerable group, same thing. We'll establish that the vulnerable group three and we'll make an appropriate referral. If they're fit and healthy, same thing. We'll establish that. We've established they've got an urgent care requirement. We're going to refer them through to the kind of group four service. But just to reiterate that, we only do that if it's absolutely required. And if it is, we run that COVID assessment. We, get, we provide a full and thorough history of the patient complaint and an updated comprehensive medical history. We place that all in our referral pro forma. That's the same pro forma we use across the system. And the way we're going to um, forward those referrals on is we're going to use generic urgent care emails. So we de de developed 92 of these, and each cluster, and each cluster UDC, will have its own bespoke um, urgent care email address. This is important because everyone in the cluster, or almost everyone in the cluster, will need to be able to interrogate that if they're staffing the hub. So everyone will have access to it. So if their COVID, the patient's COVID positive or suspicious, we're going to use the pro forma and we're going to refer it to Leeds, Sheffield and York. If it's group two, three and four, we're going to use the pro forma and we're going to refer into the appropriate UDC site. And in some cases, the CDS for triage too. So in some exceptional cases, where, does, uh, where there's an appropriate clinical dis discretionary decision made to treat at cluster level, um, that's allowable. But that's exception, exceptional rather than the rule. So to make that clear, you can treat at cluster level if you make that clinical decision and you think it's appropriate. But you have to follow the national SOP and the guidelines within the Yorkshire and Humber model. So we're going to use the pro forma for all those referrals using the generic um, Yorkshire and Humber UDC email addresses. So the final thing you'll need to do in the cluster is complete the data set. So this, is, this has come out very recently. It's going to be done through Compass. We're going to collect data on triage information, performer number, um, patient identifier. We're going to look at outcomes. We're going to look at patient group, we're going to look at primary reason for attendance, and we're going to look at workforce as well. So we're collecting some information on what's happening at, at a cluster level. So going on to triage two now. So triage two is at the cluster urgent care hub. So what will happen there is the referral ping in on the um, generic UDC email into the, into the cluster um, urgent dental care centre and then they'll make some decisions at that level. So that could be revised AAA, a referral back to the cluster for monitoring. It could be non-AGP work um, at the cluster UDC site. And to begin with, it could be referral for, non, for complex non-AGP and AGPs to the night dental and dental partner service. But once, we, once we've trained UDCs and PPE equipped them, then they should, they should be out, um, they should be able to deliver fairly comprehensive non-AGP and AGP care. I think, I, think, I think Imran will make the point next that AGPs will be restricted. We need to avoid AGPs where, wherever we can. So in summary, um, if, if you're in the cluster and you're referring to the, um, if you've got a patient who requires urgent care and is COVID positive or suspicious and they require face-to-face, -face, then you refer it into the COVID sites. If it's, if it's blue or amber, so it's normal or shielded or vulnerable, you generally refer into the cluster UDC and in some cases into the CDS, depending on the locality, locality um, service available. At second triage, you've got some other um, guidance and other options for referral. So we've set up, we're setting up systems so you can get advice and care by referral into paediatric dentistry, into the CDS, through to the um, um, 
local max fax um, services and through to restorative dentistry as well. So in general, you shouldn't be under pressure to deliver any care that you wouldn't normally provide in primary care. Clearly, if, 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 if the level of care is more specialist or you, provide, or you need guidance, you seek it and you can make what we hope are fairly accelerated referrals. In the first instance, as we're setting these services up, you have the option to refer to the UDC centres at Night Dental and Dental Partners. So we're, we're obviously giving you some training, so tonight's about some of that. We're running around Yorkshire, our, our, our mass fit testers are doing that right now. We've got several people doing a lot of excellent work, running around Yorkshire, mass fit testing and checking. They're also giving some face-to-face -face training on PPE and on doffing and donning. So we're also giving some training around the guidance. You've all got a copy of the National SOC. You've, you should all have copies of the local SOC. We've provided some local supporting information, which we'd, um, which we'd urge you to have a good look at. And we're developing um, with ProDental some on online training, and Rob will talk about that shortly. And also, I think this is hugely important. We know, we know that you know, peer review has some educational strength, and we're looking at, looking at sharing information at UDC level through, um, through video meetings. We're looking at developing and establishing best practice and communicating that. So we're setting that a kind of forum up fairly shortly for UDCs to try and iron out any problems, share, share best practice. Okay, thank you very much. Over to you, Imran. So hello again. Um, within this section of the webinar, any advice given from now on is specifically aimed at NHS UDCs, the hubs and cluster practices who have been commissioned and agreed to see patients. Those practices that have been identified, however, have not been allowed to see patients face to face yet may also benefit from this, as it will allow practices to plan their own patient and staff flow and infection control measures. And as mentioned, there will be a further education package from ProDental CPD, which will cover other sources of evidence. A quick overview of what I'm going to cover. Um, firstly, why do we need to take these extra precautions? Um, I'll be showing a, an example video of a patient flow through a practice utilizing a, a good practice example. I'll be going over the dental practice environment and zoning and how to design patient and staff flow. In regards to infection control and PPE, um, we are currently following the guidance from the National SOC and Public Health England. So please ensure that you keep up to date with any changes in the national guidance. So firstly, why do we have to take these extra precautions? Um, the standard measures that we normally implement in our practices um, are insufficient to prevent the transmission of COVID-19. And we know this from the guidance that the current consensus is that the transmission of COVID-19 is thought mainly to occur by droplet and contact methods. Now droplets are particles of more than five micrometers that settle very quickly and can travel approximately one to two meters from the patient. Contact transmission is likely the most common form of transmission and that's either via direct contact or indirect contact of surfaces. Now, airborne transmission can occur where aerosol generating procedures are performed. Now, PHE have stated that there is currently insufficient evidence that COVID-19 is spread by an airborne route unless an AGP is carried out. However, there is further research into this area that is ongoing, and much of this is looking into the concept of aerosol-based exposures, or AGEs. Now, all urgent dental care practices will need to follow both standard and standard infection control precautions and transmission-based precautions. And these are summarized in Appendix 3 of the National SOP and our regional document. Now, precautions need to be taken for all patient encounters, not just patients with suspected or confirmed COVID-19. This is a time in the UK when there is sustained community transmission of COVID-19 and the likelihood of any patient having, the, having coronavirus is raised. The incubation period can be up to 14 days and there is a risk of asymptomatic transmission. And the relevance of this in your dental practice um, is that surgeries should be well ventilated, keeping surgery doors closed at all times, appropriate PPE should be worn and social distancing should be maintained within the working environment where possible. Any procedures that are carried out should be done as, as efficiently as you possibly can minimizing the use of AGPs and reducing unnecessary clinical interactions, minimizing time spent uh, within two meters of both patients and staff. 
Um, I've created a video, um, which is a good practice example to allow practices to think about their, their own setup. So bear with me as I just play this. This video demonstrates the patient pathway and practice setup for urgent dental care within Yorkshire and Humber during the COVID-19 outbreak. It provides examples of good practice based upon current guidance. However, providers of urgent dental care need to keep up to date with guidance in particular from Public Health England and NHS England. Prior to a patient arriving at your surgery, they should be called and further triaged regarding COVID-19 symptoms and the need for urgent dental care. Where patients are able to, cons to consent for themselves, they should attend on their own. Any exemptions need to be confirmed and where payment is required, ideally this should be arranged over the phone. Patients should also be given relevant instructions with regards to their attendance, including waiting in the car on arrival. Once the patient has arrived, they should call the practice and remain in the car until the practice are ready for, ready for their attendance. At this point, the escorting dental nurse will don the appropriate PPE if they cannot maintain a safe two metre distance from the patient at all times. Following a phone call from the practice, the patient will attend on their own, ensuring that they do not bring any unnecessary items such as bags or coats. Your practice will need to make sure that there, there, there are single entry and exit points to allow for one-way flow of patients where possible. The escorting dental nurse should open the door, ensuring that the patient does not touch any surfaces where possible, and social distancing measures should be applied, including markings on the floor to indicate where the patient should stand, and also areas not to be touched or crossed. The patient should be given an alcohol hand rub to be used once they have walked into the practice. Thereafter, a non-contact thermometer should be used to assess the patient's temperature in cold sites. However, if this is not available, an alternative thermometer could be used, ensuring that they are cleaned appropriately. If the patient is unable to pay by card in advance, then any cash should be brought in in a wipeable bag and cleaned once received. It is important to zone your practice so that patient travel is minimised. In order to prepare the surgery, all unnecessary items should be removed and only the essential equipment and materials required for that specific treatment episode should be set out. A trolley should be set up outside the surgery should any additional equipment be required mid-treatment. Ideally, there needs to be a minimum of two active dental surgeries and separate donning and doffing stations. This full surgery practice has the two end surgeries set up for treatment and the two middle surgeries set up as separate donning and doffing stations. Where this is not possible, a clean surgery can be utilised for donning the PPE prior to the patient's arrival. If a doffing station is not available, then gloves and aprons or gowns can be removed within the surgery following completion of treatment, but eye protection and masks or respirators should be removed outside the surgery into a clinical waste bin. Once the surgery is prepared for treatment, the treating dentist and assisting nurse should be donning the appropriate PPE. Please refer to the Public Health England guidance and videos for donning. Once they're ready, the patient will be guided into the surgery and then the door should remain closed where possible during treatment. Windows should be left open to allow for ventilation into the surgery. Where further equipment is required, the runner nurse can pass this through the surgery door but should not enter the surgery at any point. After the patient is guided into the surgery, the escorting nurse can then clean any surfaces that may have been touched by the patient. Once treatment is complete, the escorting nurse can guide the patient out of the practice via the designated exit. The time of exit should be annotated and displayed on the door where possible. At this point, the dentist and assisting nurse can remove their PPE in the doffing station. Please refer to the Public Health England guidance and videos for doffing. In most dental surgeries, it will be safe to enter the surgery after one hour following com the completion of treatment. The surgery should then be cleaned in the appropriate PPE using a chlorine-based disinfectant at the appropriate strength. Please see the Public Health England guidance on infection control and PPE. Okay, um, so this video will be made available 
um, after this uh, webinar so that if in case you wish to watch that again, it would be possible for you. So each practice um, needs to be considering their environment and they need to walk through it as if they were a patient. There is a need to consider uh, the path of entry and the exit of the practice with minimal touching of surfaces. Ideally, a member of staff should be escorting patients in order to allow for this. Um, the points of entry and exit should be limited to ensure the uh, adherence to the protocols within the national SOC. There also needs to be adequate signage clearly informing patients regarding entry and exit, social distancing and the need to wait in their vehicles and the limitation in numbers allowed in the practice at any one time. Any areas which a patient may be seen in um, or may pass through, including waiting rooms, receptions and dental surgeries, need to be kept clean and clutter-free. All non-essential items, including toys, books and magazines, should be removed from reception and waiting areas. And in dental surgeries, all equipment or items not required for that treatment ep episode should be removed to an area outside the surgery as per the video. Please also avoid the use of air conditioning or fans as these can recirculate the air and risk transmission. Um, the practice layout will need to be assessed regarding the entry and the exit points, areas to don or apply PPE or doff or remove PPE. And, surgery, and sufficient surgery should be present in order to treat further patients to allow time for any aerosol to settle and for cleaning to occur. We'll cover a little bit more about this shortly. For all patients, there should be physical and temporal separation measures, uh, specifically thinking about um, vulnerable and shielded patients. And examples could be separate entrances and exits, appropriately spaced appointments, or sessions specifically designated for the amber or the shielded or vulnerable patients. You need to be thinking about your surgery layout and having a multi-surgery setup will allow for dedicated donning and doffing areas and accommodate room turnaround time. However, we appreciate that it's not necessarily possible to have dedicated donning and doffing areas due to a limited surgery setup. And in this case, a, a relevant risk assessment needs to be carried out. And in this case, it may be that donning can occur within a clean surgery prior to a patient arrival and doffing of or removing PPE could occur in the treatment surgery once the patient has left. Now, we must clarify that you must remove eye protection and respirators outside the dental surgery into a clinical waste bin. So please do not be removing these within a surgery. Um, dental surgeries and dental practices will need to think about the ventilation of the surgeries, the number of surgeries available, the quantities of PPE and the staff availability in order to be able to plan for the number of patients that can be safely seen. Where a practice would have two rotating surgeries, um, only one patient should be seen at any one time. And practices will need to think about appointment time slots in relation to the treatment being offered to allow any aerosol to settle if present and sufficient time for cleaning. If, say, for example, there are four rotating surgeries, so in this case, you would have uh, a rotating surgery on the left side here between two, two practices, two surgeries, and the same two rotating surgeries on the right over here. Now, in this case, two patients can be seen at any one time, but then the practices will need to consider adequate social distancing, possibly by using surgeries that are well spaced apart, having separate entrance or exit pathways or staggering appointment times. We will now look at patient flow through a practice. Um, when a patient is booked to attend an urgent care centre, consideration needs to be made to reduce processes that would normally take place in reception in order to reduce transmission. This can include medical history forms, taking payment, signing FP17 forms, or booking further appointments. So ideally, we would like you to call patients prior to arrival. Rescreen those patients regarding a COVID-19 risk and urgent dental care need. And where an escort is needed for consent purposes, that is allowed. However, otherwise, patients should be attending on their own. Um, confirm any exemptions and go over any relevant forms over the phone, including medical histories or FP17s. Practices may need to confirm with regards to the need for a physical signature, but in most instances now, it may be okay that, that these are provided without a signature. Um, please consider options for payment over the phone where possible. Um, however, if that's not possible, alternatives can include contactless payments or bringing in cash in a sealed bag as per the video. As patients arrive, please consider a face-to-face -face triage. Now, this could either be in a large room within the practice or outside the practice wearing the appropriate level two PPE. Um, this would ensure that you can, you can ensure that the patient does actually need treatment. 
And then once confirmed, the patient can then return back to the car until the practice are ready. That includes time for writing clinical notes in regards to the assessment, getting the equipment ready and donning the appropriate PPE. Once a patient enters the building, we should be ensuring that we avoid patients contacting any surfaces like door handles, and you need adequate signage and the use of an escorting dental nurse with appropriate PPE. Now, patients should be asked to decontaminate the hands as the, per the video with the alcohol hand rub, and they should be ensuring they have um, adequate cough hygiene, so give, giving out disposable tissues and things like that. In amber or blue sites, um, please consider using non-contact thermometers for all patients. Um, however, ear thermometers can be used as an alternative as long as they're clean. And in red sites, um, symptomatic patients may wear a surgical face mask. Now, I have heard that other sites that are non-red, non-COVID non positive have also been using surgical face masks, but that's not current with, a, with the current PHE guidance. The patient flow should be designed that there is one path of entry and exit, and you want to minimise the distance travel and time spent within a practice. Any areas of the practice that are not determined as necessary for the patient through fair thoroughfare should be zoned off. So practices would also need to consider the minimum level of staffing within their surgeries. The absolute minimum would be three clinical staff. However, we would prefer an ideal number of four clinical staff to allow better treatment flow. And this involves the treating dentist, if I can try and highlight that. So the treating dentist and the assisting dental nurse providing care with the dentist. You would then have a runner nurse outside the surgery to assist with passing required instruments and materials into the surgery and then a third, or a third nurse or a escorting nurse outside the surgery. These could be utilized to develop radiographs, retrieve emergency drugs, and escort patients into and out of the practice. Patients may also need to consider a receptionist. Um, it's been asked about shielding in, in terms of reception. Um, if that's possible, then you can arrange that. If not, then the receptionist may need to wear adequate PPE if they can't maintain a safe distance from patients. It's, a real, it's a really important to ensure that staff follow social distancing advice on hand hygiene and where appropriate staff may need to self-isolate based on symptoms. There is some consideration for testing staff temperature as, have been done, as has been done elsewhere, however this is not currently linked to national guidance or the current SOC. Where there are large practices that can allow for more than one patient to be seen at the time and then a minimum staffing level for these could be six staff members, so two, two sets of rotating dentists and nurses uh, and the two runner and escorting nurses, so six in total. And it's important that these two surgeries are located in different areas of the practice to maintain distancing where possible. Um, so I've created a little um, diagram of about an example flow of staff when seeing a patient. Um, once a patient has been appropriately triaged and a procedure is required, the escorting dental nurse in the bottom corner over here, if I can highlight that, um, the escorting dental nurse can uh, assess, bring the patient into the practice and carry out any risk assessments like temperature checking and the like. And during that time, the treating dentist and the assisting, uh, the assisting uh, dental nurse can don the appropriate PPE prior to the patient coming in with a, a donning body, which would be the runner nurse in this instance. The dentist and the assisting nurse can then enter the surgery prior to the patient. Now, once the patient is in surgery, the escorting dental nurse can then go back to the waiting room and then decontaminate any surfaces or equipment utilized. And the runner nurse in the middle over here, so you can highlight that, this runner nurse over there can be utilized to pass any instruments or equipment through to the surgery where required. Again, just re-highlight that that runner nurse shouldn't be entering the practice at any point, the end of surgery sorry, at any point. Thereafter, once the patient um, has been escorted out of the dental practice, the treating dentist and the assisting dental nurse from the surgery can move to the relevant doffing area and remove their PPE. Again, ideally, doffing should be carried out with a buddy, in this instance, the running nurse. From there, the treating staff can move to an appropriate room to complete their clinical records. Thereafter, they can prepare for uh, the, the next patient by donning the PPE and then move on to treat that patient in the next surgery. The escorting dental nurse, uh, then depending on the procedure completed and the infection control guidance, uh, can then go back and decontaminate um, the first surgery according to the time required. Um, I appreciate that those animations are quite complicated sometimes, so again, I'll be making this presentation available if anyone wants to watch it at a later date. There's some great advice from the BDA, and the link to this is in our document UDC practice setup. 
Um, and the first thing within this advice that's really important is don't go to work in scrubs. Go to work in clean clothes and change when you arrive. Try not to take any bags if you can. And if you're going to take your mobile phone, take that in a clear plastic bag to keep it clean. The use of a pillowcase is recommended to put clothes into as this reduces the chance of contamination or cross-contamination and it can be put straight into the washing machine when you get home. Now, the advice is to take a shower at work, but many won't be able to do that. So if so, change back into your traveling clothes at work. And then as soon as you get home, remove these clothes into the pillowcase and go straight into the shower. Now your hair and your arms could potentially be contaminated by both splatter and aerosol. So please, our advice is not to greet your family until you've had a shower. Also think about considering um, cleaning any surfaces touched like the car, washing machine, etc. Now, with such a significant change to working patterns, with uncertainty and worry, we all need to look after our well-being. This may not have been included in the documentation that we've given, but it's the responsibility of every practice and professional to look after your well-being in these times. And this includes thinking about having adequate breaks, ensuring your staff are well hydrated, particularly if wearing respirators for prolonged periods, and also having adequate downtime with access to peer support. Now, NHS E and I have provided free access to resources on people.nhs.uk. This includes a support phone line, access to mentoring and peer support and coaching. Please also be aware that certain staff may be fasting in the upcoming month, and there is guidance on this for healthcare employees from the British Islamic Medical Association. I'll now move on to infection control in UDC practices. Um, please ensure you read the regional document and the national SOP. But I'll give a quick highlight of the key points. Now, due to the risk of droplet transmission and airborne transmission during AGPs, opening a drawer in your dental surgery um, mid-treatment could risk contamination of the entire contents of that drawer. So surgery should therefore consider emptying, emptying the drawers of materials and equipment and consider alternative means of accessing equipment for that treatment. Examples can, in, examples can include setting up for the planned procedure based upon robust triage with set instruments and materials pre-planned according to that procedure. And as per the video, try and keep all extra equipment and materials outside the surgery passed in through the door by a runner nurse as requested. Again, make sure the runner nurse does not enter the surgery. It is very important to also ensure good ventilation to reduce any potential risks of airborne transmission and improve, improve clearance of aerosolized virus particles, hence the need to keep the windows open and doors closed. Please ensure that you understand the available guidance on the national SOP and PHE advice, which has been summarized in our documents in regards to decontamination and infection control. Again, the key aspects of this is where an AGP has been used, it is recommended that the room is left vacant with the windows open and doors closed for one hour before cleaning the surgery. And if possible, only one person should be undertaking the room, room decontamination. And the responsible person should be trained and familiar with the relevant processes and procedures. I won't go through the whole process of decontamination as that's in the documentation. However, again, there are a few key points that are really important adequate hand hygiene before and after cleaning and ensuring everything is ready before you enter the surgery. Use of adequate PPE, including apron, gowns, a surgical mask and eye protection to clean the room and ensure that you doff safely and appropriately. Any items used in patient care or for cleaning that are single use should be disposed of in clinical waste. And cleaning of surgeries and any reusable equipment needs to be carried out with the appropriate detergent and also a disinfectant, which is 1,000 ppm chlorine. And finally, particular in attention needs to be paid to regular and thorough cleaning of your communal areas, including door handles and waiting rooms and toilets. Um, and once that cleaning and disinfection has been completed, the area can be put back into use. Now, there are, there are two main national guidance documents, the SOP and the PHE guidance in regards to PPE, and our document summarises that. Uh, this document has been circulated, but as, as mentioned, further will be distributed for those who do not currently have access to it. I'm aware, and we are aware, that there is contention in regards to the definition of AGPs and PPE. However, as clinicians, we have to understand that the gui there is guidance. We should be carrying out our own risk assessment and utilise our cl clinical discretion. Thereafter, you can come to your own decision that is best for the patient, for yourself and for your team in that individual circumstance. We have all hopefully seen this table from the National SOP highlighting relevant PPE for the setting and treatment. And as mentioned, this requires local risk assessment, clinician discretion and judgment. 
something that's really important is that anybody who's been sent FFP3s or has bought them, they must be fit tested and they must be fit tested for that specific type and brand of mask. Fit testing does not cover any other model of mask, even if it's the same brand. And if you have a mask and you haven't been fit tested, you should be contacting Public Health England, so the dental public health consultants in our region, in order to get access to fit testing. And this is mandatory to have fit testing as per the National SOP and HSE guidance. Then once you are donning that mask prior to the patient arriving, you must make sure that you are fit checking each time that you put that mask on as per the PHE advice on donning. So there are both posters and videos that have valuable education in order to be able to do donning and doffing safely. This is linked in our document and also accessible by Public Health England. Now donning and doffing is key for both AGPs and non-AGPs. And in the current climate, we should not be removing any PPE in the surgery while the patient is still there. This includes taking gloves off to write notes. Ideally, the PPE stays on for as long as it's needed and then only touched when it's ready to come off. Clinical records and note keeping should be done outside the surgery in a clean environment. Now there is a high risk of contamination specifically when doffing or removing PPE. And that's specifically where inappropriate touching or handling of the PPE on the face occurs, as this could inadvertently aerosolize or create droplets that could be inhaled or come into contact with mucous membranes. Therefore, all staff who are taking part in urgent care should be watching the videos on donning and doffing weekly. They should have laminated copies of this quick reference guide that we've got up on the screen. Um, and these should be watched, looked at every single time you're carrying out donning and doffing. And always have a buddy present in order to make sure the things are being doing right, done right. And the one thing I want you to really make sure you pay attention to is closing your eyes when taking the masks, respirators and visors off. So I must stress that adequate doffing is key to your safety, even with a non-AGP PPE. So please do not remove your mask or respirator in the dental surgery used for treatment. Um, and in regards to single or sessional use of PPE, we've taken further advice on PHE for this. All gloves, gowns and aprons should be single use, and this is due to the risk of splatter. However, for masks, respirators and eye protection, it is down to individual practice risk assessment. Our dental public health colleagues have advised single use is ideal where possible. However, where a practice decides that their risk assessment uh, shows that a sessional use is okay, shopping, gloves and gown can be carried out in the surgery and keep your mask your respirator and the visor on for the whole session and do not leave the clinical area so within the, the group of surgeries that you're in however if your eye and face protection becomes damaged soiled or uncomfortable it should be discarded and replaced and not subject to continued use and if you do end up taking your mask or visor off this should then go straight into the clinical waste bin. But I do appreciate there are some respirators and visors that are multi-use and therefore they need to be decontaminated in that regard. Please do not put masks, respirators or visors down on a clinical surface. You have to understand that when, you, when you're gonna carry out sessional use, you can't have a drink of water while the mask is on. So therefore, you practices really need to carry out a full risk assessment before deciding on sessional use. So in summary, we've given an overview of the Yorkshire and Humber NHS UDC structure and referral pathways and triage. We've given a very brief, brief overview of practice design and setup and also infection control. And this is supported by the three documents that you've been sent. If you haven't got access to these, we will make these available for you after the webinar. On to the next steps. Now we would like all hubs and UDC sites to start utilizing the guidance that are available, start creating a local rules and SOP. This covers zoning, patient flow, staffing and staff flow. Um, hopefully I will be made available and we will be available in order to help support hub staff and UDC sites in producing these rules. So if you can make a, make a draft guide, this is something that we potentially will be able to help with. In terms of further training, as you know, Pro Dental CPD will have an online course available in the next week or so. And I would like to pass over to James Spencer in regards to any further questions. OK, so what we've done is uh, we've created, um, in conjunction with all the panellists here and others as well, um, oh, hello, my presentation is running through for you. It's an online package, so it's, a lot of it's video-based learning. It's very interactive. There are lots of resource documents available within it as well. So all the things that Imran and James have been and Simon have been talking about already will be available. 
uh, we're looking at all aspects as Imran and, and Simon have kind of gone through there. We're looking at uh, the initial uh, background to coronavirus, is the first section, which will probably take, I suspect, about an hour and a half or so. Uh, the second section looks at triage, which again, Imran and Simon have just touched on here. It's all in sections here. Uh, and then the third section is reducing the risk of COVID. So it's basically something on your UDC. So I'll just look through this quickly. And the fourth and final section is just safely treating patients, which just goes through the PPE transmission, what we, we know. We're looking at PHE advice, but we're looking always at the best evidence. At the end of the day, we're all practicing clinicians here. So it's the best evidence uh, that's available at the moment. We're very well aware that uh, with the course, um, it's, it's a moving playing field, so that the, the guidelines are changing virtually on a daily basis sometimes. The course itself will be, stand, will be standalone, um, and there will be a link sent through to everybody after, after this webinar in the next two or three days. The, the plan is, in fact, no, it will be, it will be up and live on Monday online, and uh, we are uh, kind of pushing the LDCs, LDNs, and also uh, some of the big dental corporates for funding so we can make it free at points of access, which is, again, looking very promising. It will be backed up. It's not just an a online course. The online course is one part of the package. As well as that, there will be a forum. It will be a live forum that's attached to the course. So anybody who's on doing the course, the start of the course, will be able to engage with other users uh, to look at best practice or any, any problems or issues that they may have. And we're planning regular webinars. It may be weekly, it may be more, <laughs> maybe less. it will depend on what's necessary at the time. But there'll be weekly live webinars that will be run with some of the people here. We've got other people as well who will be more than happy to be involved. And we, we're overwhelmed with the support that we've had from colleagues. I think it's a great opportunity. Just to recap, the online course will be in four sections of on-demand video-based interactive e-learning. All content has been and will be peer-reviewed and quality assured. Uh, there will be an interactive forum attached to the course available for colleagues to share experiences and concerns at this time. The course will be updated on a daily basis as appropriate and all users will be automatically informed of any changes. There will be regular live webinars also to support our colleagues during this time and the course will have a full up-to-date library of resources, videos, uh, including downloadable resources for staff to use in practice. Once again, many thanks for watching this uh, introductory webinar from the Yorkshire and Humber region.